I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. My guest today on Dementia Matters is Dr. Michelle Mielke, a professor of epidemiology and neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Mielke studies sex-specific differences in the risk and progression of neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. Another focus of her work is biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Dr. Mielke, for taking the time to join us for an episode on Dementia Matters. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Well, you're a part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Mayo Clinic, and so your ADRC has a very robust research, diagnosis, and education program, and many of the National Institutes on Aging affiliated Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers across the country have specialties and focus areas surrounding dementia research. Could you share with us some of the program highlights from the Mayo Clinic ADRC? Sure. Um, but let me first start by just giving a, a little bit of a background about the Mayo Clinic ADRC. Um, so our ADRC is a collaborative effort between Mayo Clinic Rochester and Mayo Clinic Jacksonville in Florida. Um, so that, this really allows us to capitalize on the strengths of both institutes. Uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester has a larger clinical practice, which we can recruit uh, patients into research including Alzheimer's disease, but also other types of dementia, such as um, Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal lobe dementia. And Rochester has been uh, more of a leader in developing neuroimaging and fluid markers of uh, Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Um, Jacksonville is the home site for our Department of Neuroscience at Mayo Clinic. So Rochester has some basic science up here, but neuroscience is really located in Jacksonville. So that's our our hub for any part to do with basic science research, genetic research. Um, The brain bank and neuropathology group is down there. Uh, That includes uh, brains from Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, as well as um, a state of Florida Alzheimer's Disease Initiative. So it's quite large and covers a a variety of dementias. Um, In addition, investigators in Jacksonville have developed a cohort of African-Americans to cognitively follow. And that's advantageous to our our group because, as you know, and and a little bit more similar to Wisconsin, the population around Rochester, at least at older ages, say 65 and older, is primarily white. So it allows us to add a little bit more diversity and to examine differences between um, whites and blacks in terms of risk factors. So using this, um, capitalizing on, on these different strengths, um, and as you mentioned, each center has uh, different focus areas. So the, the theme of our combined Mayo ADRC is to investigate the similarities and differences among neurodegenerative diseases. So in addition to enrolling a good number of Alzheimer's disease patients, um, we also enrolled uh, several patients with frontal temporal lobe dementia, uh, many with uh, Lewy body dementia, and then some patients that are at risk of Lewy body dementia. So REM sleep behavior disorder um, it is a significant risk factor for further developing dementia. And so we enroll some of those participants as well and, and follow them. And then the general focus is to try and understand the overlaps between these different dementias with regards to clinical symptoms, um, neuroimaging measures, genetics, uh, and pathological mechanisms. Well, in that vein, then, some of your research is focused on addressing this sort of gap in our understanding of sex and gender differences in the development of the various cognitive disorders that you mentioned, including Alzheimer's disease. So could you start by explaining to us what differences currently exist? Yeah, so that's... Um, let me just first start out um, in saying that, you know, while we we might say duh to ourselves and saying there are differences between men and women, um, there really is limited understanding of sex differences in the development of any type of cognitive disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. Um, there is starting to be more research in the area. So if somebody is interested, this is a great time to get involved or, or start to follow as, as new things are coming out. 
Um, but that it's, it's certainly been a hole in, in trying to understand Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. There, there's a lot of media around sex differences for Alzheimer's disease. And um, many listeners have probably heard reports that women are at greater risk. Um, but as all with all things, um, and with science in general, things are, are much more complicated than just a simple statement. Um, different terminology is used, which can also make it more confusing. So uh, let me just start out by um, giving an overview of, I guess, the, the epidemiology of uh, Alzheimer's disease and sex differences and um, what we're finding right now. So it, if we look at the frequency of Alzheimer's disease, which is the count or the total number um, of women affected with Alzheimer's disease and the total of men affected with Alzheimer's disease in the US, roughly two thirds of all clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's cases are women. But um, it's important to keep in mind that Alzheimer's disease is an aging related condition and women live longer than men. So um, by simple count, as a result, there's more women at older ages, and therefore there are more women with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, um, some of the work we're currently doing in the Van Plank study of aging is trying to understand some of these sex differences. And we find that men who, um, if you compare men and women with uh, Alzheimer's pathology, so amyloid and tau in their brains, men are more likely to die before they develop symptoms. And once they're diagnosed with dementia, men are also more likely uh, or at greater risk of dying sooner compared to women. So th there's certainly a mortality bias there. Um, but if we start to look at incidence, um, and this could be defined as say, we compare a man or woman, um, let's say at the age of 75 and we follow them for five years. And we wanna find out if over those five years, more women or more men uh, develop Alzheimer's disease or, or other types of dementia. Um, when we look in the US, almost every study um, has not found a difference. There may be slighter, slight elevated increases for women as compared to men, but it's not significant and is generally not close. Um, but what's interesting is that um, although we really don't see a difference in the United States, when you look at some countries in Europe and other countries around the world, um, such as in South America, there does appear to be a greater risk for women. So again, if we're comparing a man or woman at the age of 75 or 80 and follow them for a specific numbers of years, in those countries, um, women do appear to be at greater risk. And so what are some of the proposed or even historical explanations for some of these differences that you're seeing, as well as some of the ones that are currently being explored by researchers such as yourself? So I, I think we, at this point, um, we don't fully know what these differences are. Um, but the exciting part is that the fact that there are differences by countries uh, suggests that there are probably uh, cultural differences, such as diet, uh, societal roles, that can cause um, these differences between the U.S. and other countries. And this is particularly exciting to me because a lot of these factors can potentially be modifiable. Um, so in terms of cultural roles, education for women, um, different types of diet, if we can identify those, then that is something that um, we can used for preventive or for treatment efforts. Um, one specific uh, explanation as to what some of the differences might be between the US and some European countries is the impact of World War II. So uh, although the US you know, participated in World War II and, and many of the men from the US went over and fought in the battles, the experience for women were quite a bit different. Um, it's not to say that women didn't experience hardship here and, of course, went to work and, and had a lot of stressors, but that um, it is a little bit different than women who were, say, in Italy or Germany or, or some of um, the other countries in Europe who experienced not only the war itself, but also a lot of the political upheaval, upheaval before and after the war, uh, which also led to um, less availability for education, even more, even beyond um, the availability for women at the time. 
And so that stress could potentially be contributing to the excess risk of, of dementia in, in women in those countries. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see over time if, if this evens out um, or if those countries still tend to experience greater risk for women. And what role, I mean, when, when thinking about the biology of men and women, what role do you think pregnancy and menopause play in the development of cognitive disorders and Alzheimer's disease? So that's a, a great question and has been a, a major focus of research for women within the Alzheimer's disease field. Um, my view on it is that um, you know pregnancy and menopause do not cause cognitive disorders or Alzheimer's disease per se. Um, you know, all women go through menopause, but not all women are going to end up with developing cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease or other dementias down the road. So I, I, I see the role of pregnancy and menopause more as stress tests to potentially identify the women who are at greater risk. Um, if you think about with pregnancy um, and of course menopause, there are certainly hormonal changes but there are also a lot of other synchronous adaptations that the body must go through. So with pregnancy, um, you've got a, a change in immune response, so the body doesn't reject the fetus. You've also got change in the vasculature, so the body can take on more fluids and, and a whole host of other symptoms. Um, so, you know, as women are, are going through these, um, it gives us an opportunity to kind of stress the body system and see if there are any adverse events um, potentially as a result. So in some cases, it's kind of similar to undergoing a cardiology stress test where, um, you know, you might not see differences in heart rate or other heart parameters just by sitting at rest. But when, you know, people go start to exercise, that's when you see differences. And so I, I view it a little bit similar with pregnancy and menopause. Um, so for example, with, with regards to pregnancy, uh, one thing we have been examining is whether there's a difference in risk of cognitive impairment for women who develop hypertensive pregnancy disorders or preeclampsia uh, during their pregnancy. And one of the, the first studies that we published um, using the Family Blood Pressure Project, which it incorporated uh, about half a cohort was white and half a cohort was uh, African-American, we found that those women who did have or did report, they had pregnancies with high blood pressure or with preeclampsia, sometimes also called toxemia. Um, it, it, when these women were in their 60s and 70s, they had worse cognition and they also had greater brain atrophy. So um, this suggested to us that maybe hypertensive pregnancy disorders um, could be a risk factor for dementia. Um, hypertensive pregnancy disorders have previously been shown to be risk factors for hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And so this research and some of our current studies are, are trying to figure out um, what the impact of these disorders on the brain are. And I think that the positive aspect of this is that, um, you know, once these women are diagnosed and, and identified, we can follow them up more closely and make sure that their vascular risk factors are properly treated and, and also conduct um, cognitive screening, maybe starting in midlife to better assess their risk. So it gives us the stress test of pregnancy, gives us the early opportunity to better identify those at risk. And similarly with regards to menopause, again, all women go through menopause, but not all uh, develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, what's apparent is that some women go through menopause and they hardly have any symptoms, whereas other women go through menopause and they experience a wide variety of symptoms, some very se severe, especially related to mood changes and hot flashes. Um, some of the, the new research right now is suggesting that women who experience the most severe hot flashes may be at greater risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease down the road. Um, now, while more, more work is needed, this may be an opportunity again to identify those women who are at greater risk of cerebrovascular disease and, and potentially also dementia, and um, therefore follow them more closely. And in particular with menopause, you know, because there's so much discussion about hormones, you know, obviously that's a it's a huge hormonal change for for women, right? And could hormone replacement therapy be something that might change this course, this risk factor, 
or the trajectory that someone might be on as far as cognitive change? So that's a great question. And um, maybe I'm a a little long winded again, but there's a whole history in terms of of thinking about hormone replacement therapy in women after menopause and its relation to dementia. Um, It's also another thing that hasn't been um, explained fully. And there's there have been a lot of confusing messages regarding the use of hormone replacement therapy, um, which can also be called menopausal hormone therapy or, or estrogen therapy. Um, when the original observational studies were out in the 1990s, they suggested that the use of hormone therapy um, could uh, reduce your risk of dementia, um, specifically Alzheimer's disease. However, a limitation with just uh, observational studies, which means just following women um, over a number of years, maybe 10 or 15 years, and observing who develops dementia or not, is uh, that you do have a healthy user bias in terms of who. Get, ends up taking uh, or using hormone therapy. So typically women who are healthier um, or those that are more educated and, and maybe ask more questions to their physicians are more likely to be prescribed a hormone therapy. So the first um, really large randomized clinical trial to examine hormone therapy um, was the Women's Health Initiative. And a- actually at the time, that was the largest and most costly trial to date that the NIH had funded. Uh, that trial had looked at the impact of um, oral estrogens, conjugated equine estrogens versus placebo on risk of dementia, as well as a variety of other outcomes. And the research were, was, or the outcomes were published in 2002 and suggested that um, women who were randomized to the oral estrogens were actually at greater risk of dementia and of cardiovascular disease compared to women that were randomized to placebo. So this um, really threw things up in the air and was opposite of what a lot of people had heard in terms of uh, observational studies. And it it, uh, ended up drastically changing the practice and um, the number of women that were on menopausal hormone therapy really plummeted after that. However, um, there was a, a key limitation to the study. And that is that the mean age of the women at the time of randomization um, was about 65 years. So the average age of menopause for women is about 50 or 51. So they were starting the estrogen therapy on average about 15 years after they had gone through menopause. So women's bodies got used to um, being in estrogen deficient state. And then after several years, were given the estrogen. And so one thought was that um, after the re-exposure, you know, that might have actually increased um, adverse events such as dementia and cardiovascular disease. So since then, there have been a couple of other clinical trials um, that randomized women to menopausal hormone therapy or placebo, um, but started the uh, estrogen therapy within a couple of years of, of onset of menopause. And in general, those trials have um, not found a detrimental effect of the use of estrogen therapy. Um, They have not found really a protective effect either, um, even with following women over four to seven years. So I think, you know, long story short, um, the initiation of hormone therapy, maybe 10 to 15 years after natural menopause, we think can increase the risk of dementia. But if hormone therapy is the initiative uh, during the menopausal transition or a few years afterwards, it does not appear to have an effect on estrogen, either negative or positive. So I I wouldn't necessarily go in and prescribe or think about taking uh, menopausal hormone therapy just to prevent dementia. But I think uh, women who especially are experiencing menopausal symptoms and it's impacting their quality of life, um, I want them to know that in general, it is okay to take menopausal hormone therapy and that it won't directly affect the risk of dementia down the road. Now, one of the things that you mentioned early in in your answer was it was conjugated equine estrogen. And so that equine being horse, correct? And and so I guess I wonder too, and I, and I get a lot of questions from my patients about, well, what if we didn't use um, equine and we used a more human-based sort of replacement therapy, do you think that that would make a difference in some of these results or that that might not actually have an effect? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question and, and something that um, we and, and others are interested in. Um, 
there does appear to be evidence that 17 beta estradiol may be better for brain health uh, as compared to the conjugated equine estrogens, which are, are orally taken. Um, just to, to highlight one study, um, the Cronus Early Estrogen Protection, Protection Study, or KEEP study, um, is a, a study that randomized women to the oral conjugated equine estrogens, uh, 17 beta estradiol patch, or placebo, within three years of, of natural menopause, and they followed them for up to seven years. Now, they didn't see any difference in terms of cognition between the two estrogens, um, but two investigators, Dr. Kajal Kantarsi from Mayo and Dr. Kerry Gleason from University of Wisconsin-Madison, did a, a sub-study where they imaged those uh, women that were at the enrolled at the Mayo Clinic site. So there were about 100 women and they did amyloid imaging, uh, tau imaging, and then also MRI. And within that subset, they found that those women that were randomized to 17 beta estradiol had lower amyloid levels in their brain compared to the conjugated equine estrogens or uh, to placebo. So they now have a, a large study um, of all sites uh, that were enrolled in the KEEP. So there are about 800 women and they are going back and imaging everybody to see if they can replicate that finding. And of course, as you mentioned, if they do, that would suggest that 17 beta estradiol, at least for brain health, um, may be more protective and, and may actually be uh, a protective factor. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that for us. And I think that is an important finding. I didn't realize it was male and UW, so that seems kind of biased that I asked it, but I think that's a great, it's a great finding. Um, you know, I'm also wondering about genetic risks. And so in particular, the, the risk factor of APOE4, and are there differences in the development of Alzheimer's disease for people with APOE4 based on gender and sex? Yes, there, there does appear to be a difference. Um, you know, APOE is the strongest uh, genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And if you have one E4 allele of the APOE4 gene, you, you're at two to threefold increased risk. And those two alleles are at about an eight to tenfold increased risk. Um, but it, it's not a deterministic gene, meaning that not all individuals with um, the E4 allele actually develop dementia. Um, there have been several studies, um, even recently, that have suggested that women with an E4 allele are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to men with an E4 allele. Um, now, although we see this, uh, again, in several studies, um, the reason for this is, is not yet well understood, and, and there's a lot of ongoing research trying to understand that. And then in regards to biomarkers, like we mentioned with amyloid and tau, do those differ for women compared to men in regard to risk of disease or threshold for diagnosis or even predictive value? Yeah. Um, when you compare levels of uh, amyloid and tau, either looking in the blood, in the cerebrospinal fluid after doing a lumbar puncture, um, or, or in the brain um, after autopsy, there really is not a difference in the amount of these proteins um, for women versus men. Uh, however, th there may be prognostic differences. So the, a couple studies highlight this. Um, one recent study had reported that for the same level of brain amyloid measured via uh, amyloid PET imaging, women were more likely to accumulate tau and accumulate it faster than men were. So this would potentially suggest that um, women would be at greater risk of developing dementia because tau is, uh, the, the accumulation of tau it causes neurodegeneration and that is more closely tied to clinical symptoms. Um, but other studies, including looking at this in the male clinic study of aging, has not replicated this finding. So that, that's still a little bit questionable there in terms of prognosis. But um, there have been quite a few studies, uh, both pathological and clinical studies, that have shown for the same level of amyloid and tau pathology, women are more likely to show memory impairment and other cognitive symptoms. Um, again, the reason behind this is not fully clear. One thought has been that women have smaller head sizes than men, and so therefore, for the same level of pathology, women have less resistance and, and therefore show more clinical symptoms. But, um, you know, again, that's an, an ongoing area of research and, and something that we are keenly interested in. 
Well, really, you know, I would like to end our interview today with a question I ask a lot of my guests. And for someone like you, who's, who's so knowledgeable in the field of Alzheimer's disease, I really like to understand what do you do in your personal life to maintain that brain health and to minimize your own risk for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, so for for me, I, I guess my focus, um, I do try and get uh, enough exercise, and uh, I do try to eat the best I can. Th- those are the two main things. And actually, for me, um, exercise is really important in, in terms of stress. And so I can tell you that if I don't exercise for a couple of days, my family will tell me to go to the gym. You know, you're getting irritable and and go do something and, and I feel better afterwards. So, you know, certainly in terms of my mood, it, it helps and, and other things. So that that's something that I, I am very religious about, um, probably work out five or six times a week. And then with diet, as for, of course, in the current situation too, with working at home and you've got the refrigerator right there, that's a little bit harder, but still try and eat um, more fruits and vegetables. And um, I, I really uh, don't eat red meat, not to say that that's a specific risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but it, more of a personal choice in, in terms of family history and cardiovascular disease. So I, I think those are the, the two things that, um, that I tend to focus on. Well, I thank you for sharing that personal information on the podcast, but we do, we do appreciate learning from our experts in the field and what they're doing on a day-to-day level. And, and thank you for sharing all of the, the historical and ongoing uh, context for sex differences, gender differences, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, with that, you know, we would love to have you back uh, on the show in the future time when you have more to share with us. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to have an opportunity to talk with you. Please subscribe to Dementia Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.